Okay, here we go. Uh, start again. Give me a second. Okay. All right. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, tonight's content we will be looking into some of the aspect of the uh, trademark. Uh, trademark acts, which cover the trademark infringement actions and uh, the remedies for the uh, trademark infringement actions, legal remedies, trademark offenses, criminal offenses, okay? Even corporate responsibilities, okay? And then as well as the uh, trademark enforcement, we will examine the uh, trademark enforcement authority their rights and the power they possess under the trademark Malaysians, uh, sorry, Malaysians Trademark Act, okay, 2019. So we will start with the civil part, which is the civil litigations, all right? As you know, we have two sides of uh, uh, enforcement actions here, the civil side and the uh, criminal side, the offenses, I call it. Sorry. Well, let me start with the civil side. So we are talking about the civil uh, trademark and infringement under the Trademark Act. Section 54, subsection 1 of the Trademark Act actually gives the power for a registered trademark proprietor to commence any actions, any, for, I mean, to commence a trademark infringement action against any party for using, you know, a registered mark, his registered mark without his consent. And the mark is identical to the to which he's applying for, and then of course to the list of goods or services he, the registered provider has applied for. All right. Now we have two situation here. Uh, subsection two, okay, actually define clearly what is the uh, legal requirement for the uh, uh, a person to commence an inf trademark infringement. Uh, against the others. So section 54 sub 2 say that a person infringe a registered trademark if without the consent of the proprietor, he uses the mark, he uses the sign in the course of trade. Okay, that is identical to the trademark or similar to the trademarks. And most importantly, okay, being identical or similar to the trademark is not enough. It must result in the likelihood of confusions on the part of the public. Meaning that you must be a registered trademark owner to sue somebody for trademark infringement. If you are unregistered trademark owner under Section 54.2, you are not uh, eligible, I would say, to commence such an actions. Of course, uh, when can we actually sue them? Actually, it's very simple, straightforward. In the situation that somebody is using the uh, registered mark, belongs to a registered proprietor without his or her consent. And the mark must be identical or similar with the trademark and used in re relation to the goods. So your mark must be similar or identical and the list of goods or services must be similar or identical as well. And as a result of this, you are causing the uh, confusions on the part of the public. So with all this requirement in place, we may now commence the Section 54, the trademark infringement actions, legal actions against the other party. So again, the Act defines, okay, what do you mean by use? Remember, um, if I highlight the uh, blue color column here, uh, uh, this uh, line here, this, this words here, uses, use, okay, use. So, what you mean by use? Under section 54.3, this is the definitions, okay, for a use. A person uses a sign if he apply it, it means a sign, to the goods or their packaging. Offer, expose the goods for sale under the sign. You put the goods on the market under the sign. You stock up at the, under the, using the sign. 
offer supply of services under the sign. Now, import or export of goods using the sign or under the sign. So you you may be uh, you may be you know exporting for others using the trademark. So please be aware, yeah? okay? Uh, this will also result in trademark infringement. All right? You are also infringing other people's trademark. Now, using the sign on invoice, catalog, businesses in uh, uh, documents, including any mediums, any medium as in like soft copy, websites, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And you know, if you use the sign in any advertisement, that's very straightforward. All right. So, all this scenario here, A, B, C, D, until H, okay, will define what we will actually define what you mean by use, okay? A person uses a, a, a sign. A sign means a trademark, okay? So if you, if you do all this, you are using, you know, uh, another people's sign, okay? With, okay of, with or without his uh, consent, all right? So we know that what are the acts amounting to infringement? Now, let's come to this part here where some of the acts here are not amounting to any acts of conduct, okay, basically, not amounting to any infringement of the uh, trademarks. So section 54 will define, as I said, mentioned earlier, the, uh, what are the conducts that, uh, and the requirements for a trademark infringement to commence. And section 55 will actually clarify, will, will, will spell out, what are the scenarios that a person does not actually infringe a registered trademark? So the first scenario is when he used in good faith the name of the place and or business, the name of his predecessor in the business, okay, or he uses in good faith a sign to indicate the quality, quantity, intent, purpose, blah 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 blah. Okay, so you can read from the act. All right. First, if you use it in good faith, all right? Good faith doesn't mean that, uh, the, the definition for good faith is very, very wide, uh, okay? But I'm, unfortunately, I'm not gonna go into this, this, uh, this topic today, all right? So I will just carry on to a second scenario. Now, the next scenario is that um, a person does not infringe a registered trademark by using a unregistered trademark that is similar or identical to a, another, I mean, to the uh, registered trademark in relation to a good service, blah, 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 continuously used in the, in the course of trade, the unregistered trademark in relation to goods of before the time, be from a time, sorry, before the date of the registration of a registered mark. Okay, let me explain to you what you mean by this. Now, um, if you can prove that you have been using this particular trademark, okay? Even though it's unregistered, and even though you have been using this uh, by your maybe ancestor, by your predecessor in the business for such a long time, before the application and the, before the registration of the, of, the regis of the registered mark, okay? Then you do not, you do not, a person, you will not infringe the registered trademark, okay? In other words, we call this a, uh, concurrent, you know, there, there's a provision in the, in the uh, act actually which gives rise to the honest concurrent use or maybe they call it the prior use, all right? So before, I mean, you have been using this trademark for such a long time, before somebody registered for the mark, under this section 50, 55 two, you do not actually infringe the registered trademark, okay? However, you need to prove that, all right? That is not, it doesn't come automatic to you. Now, B, from the date of the registered, pro, uh, from the date of the registered proprietor, okay, or person, uh, or please, in business, or a person who was a registered user under the OAC, first used the mark. Okay, I mean, these two, A and B, has some similarity in between, whereby we actually look at, you know, um, honest concurrent use, and or maybe, I would say the uh, uh, common law first right, first use, all right, of the mark, whichever is earlier, okay? 
So yeah, you have been using it for such a long time and you can prove that you have been using it for such a long time. Even before the date, before the date of registration of the particular mark, you will not subject to you know, the uh, infringement of the uh, trademarks. Okay, um, third scenario. A person who uses a registered trademark does not infringe the uh, trademark if such use is for non-commercial purposes. So um, non-commercial purposes, all right? And for purpose of news reporting and news commentary. So if I mention any trade names in my video, in my lecture today, it is basically for the news reporting and news commentary. Basically, I won't do any advertisement. I don't accept any advertisement here. But however, sometimes when we do case study, we normally will refer to some of the past cases, past uh, federal court cases and all these things. And those are news reporting and news commentary. If I happen to mention your name there, I'm so sorry. It's without intentions. Of course, I'm just doing my job, you know, as a, uh, giving some commentary over the uh, past, you know, precedence. Okay, C expressly or impliedly consented by the registered proprietor. So you get a consent from a registered proprietor, okay, to use the mark and that wouldn't amount to any infringement. Now implied consent can be done. Implied means can be done by actions. Because of the actions, because of the uh, conduct by the registered proprietor in allowing you to continuously use for the, uh, what do you call it, the uh, trademark, it doesn't uh, amount to any infringement. However, this, please don't get me wrong, okay? Consent can be withdrawn by the registered proprietor from time to time, okay? So, uh, the use of the trademark given by registration as provided under this act, okay? Now, the fourth scenario, fourth scenario is that a registered trademark is not infringed by the use of another registered trademark in relation to goods and services for which the later is registered. So, meaning to say that, okay, if I got a uh, trademark registration from the, uh, let's say, my IPO, my IPO, okay, they approve my trademark registrations. And uh, you, you want to sue me for trademark infringement over the use of whatever trademark registration I got here on hand, because you think that these are identical or very similar, okay, to yours. Uh, um, you, are not, you are not eligible to commence an infringement actions under this act. Uh, you, may, you may apply to the court to expunge or to remove my trademark uh, so-called registrations, but you are not uh, eligible to actually commence an infringement action against me because, uh, uh, if, uh, because I already got a registered trademark on hand. So the safest uh, practice for every business, small businesses is that today, please go and register your trademark. Okay, it's a simple, simple thing you can do. When you got a registered trademark, at least you are protected. You know that you, know, you have a certificate of registration, you are protected by law, that uh, under section 55, you wouldn't be sued by, I mean, you wouldn't be actually sued by somebody for infringing, you know, the mark they've been using, okay? All right. Okay, let's look at some of the legal remedies. When you go to your lawyer and you seek uh, your lawyer service, IP services, IP litigation services to sue somebody for trademark infringement, so what can you get? from the court, all right? Let's look into this. Now, section 56, one, it actually spell out the rights of a trademark owner, registered proprietor. You shall have the right to institute, okay, court proceeding against any person who has infringed or infringing the registered trademark. So subsection one says that you may sue somebody for infringed or is infringing. Past tense, present tense, all right? Infringe or is infringing the registered trademark. Under clause two, you may also um, take an action, okay, against uh, anybody, you know, who is likely to infringe. 
likely means maybe yes or maybe no. Okay, likely to infringe. Okay, like so uh, if the person has performed the acts which may make it likely that an infringement will occur, meaning that okay, you may have the same rights okay against anybody if you think that the way he do such a thing would likely to infringe your trademark. Okay, so under 56 one or two, you may have the rights of actions against anyone found infringing, infringed, or likely to, that that infringement will occur. Okay. All right. So what can we get from the court? Section 56.3, in any action for infringement, the court may grant relief, including A, injunctions. So we, I think everyone knows what is injunctions. Basically, is to prevent others from uh, performing such an act. So you may also, if the court thinks fit, okay, you may also prevent uh, the defendants from, uh, you know, uh, from delivering the goods, okay, they grant an injunction to the plaintiff so that the defendant could, they could prevent the defendant from, uh, from entering, from, from, uh, from entering, yeah, into the channel of commerce, all right, that's an injunction to stop somebody from doing certain things, okay, court may grant damages, damages, all right, uh, in terms of damages, so how much you have uh, for the past damages. Accounts of profits, okay? Accounts of profits or additional damages, if you think fits. Sometime in any uh, civil, uh, what they call it, uh, civil litigations, IP litigations, now the uh, plaintiff may apply to the court uh, to, when, of course, a relief for additional damages, maybe to punish the uh, defendants for, you know, for, 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 the, for infringing the trademark, et cetera, et cetera, okay? So the court also may grant damages and the account of profits at the same time, all right? So this is a paycheck. Now remember, okay, uh, this is, these are the uh, court, what they call it, the remedies available for a registered trademark owners in any uh, trademark infringement actions against uh, the, any, any, anyone, all right? Now, 56 and 50, uh, sorry, 50, 56, three and 56, uh, 56, seven, there's something different is that um, this provision deals specifically for count for a infringement where counterfeiting involved. Okay. If you found and if you're caught, okay, counterfeiting a registered trademark, of course, you are, you will be liable for the uh, offenses as well. Okay, which I later I will describe. How um, in the civil suit, in the litigation, in the civil IP litigations, all right, under 56.7, you will be, the plaintiff will be entitled at his own choices, okay, A, damages and account of profits, okay, B, account of profits, C, additional damages as is considered in appropriate circumstances, okay. So, I, if I mention C, uh, C additional damages, in, in these situations, the plaintiff can actually uh, propose, okay, seek relief from the court that you would like to be compensated for, let's say, one million ringgit, okay, to compensate and to punish the defendant for counterfeiting the trademark, et cetera, et cetera. So, it's up to the court to decide whether to grant such an order or not, all right? Now, 56 clause uh, subsection 9, um, all this relief under 56, uh, 56 3, all these damages that you, you are seeking, okay, um, a registered proprietor shall, you know, shall not recover any relief under 3 for infringement or anything happened prior to the date of the applications for protections of the trademark is made and become registered in Malaysia. So basically, we are looking at the date of the applications 
Okay, when do you apply for your trademark? When do you apply for your trademark in Malaysia? All right, so we are looking at the date of the applications. Okay, you cannot claim anything, any damages uh, beyond that specific date. All right, you can only start counting the loss, the damages after the date of the uh, application uh, is made, okay, and become registered in Malaysia. So there are a lot of people asking me, Lawrence, um, I want to sue somebody, you know, I want to sue somebody, uh, of course, in Malaysia. Um, but my trademark is still pending, you know, it's still pending for registration. It hasn't gone through all the examination stage. So what can I do? Now, legally speaking, under the trademark law, under, sorry, under the Trademark Act, okay, 2019, you cannot commence a legal actions, okay, infringement against somebody if your mark is still unregistered, okay? You haven't got the registration. However, you may actually notify the person that you, you, are, you have uh, so-called, uh, you know, uh, applied for trademarks. And if the person is still like uh, infringing, keep on infringing, keep on, you know, uh, uh, infringing your trademarks, okay, using your trademark without your consent. Now, you may claim the damages from the date of your date of the application was made, okay? Uh, not, be, not beyond that, but after the date of applications, okay, where it's made in Malaysia and registered in Malaysia. I hope everybody understood my, uh, my explanation so far, yeah? So, Besides damages, injunctions, account for profits, and others. Now, the uh, plaintiff in this case may also uh, seek the court order okay, to erase, remove, obliterate the offending sign from any infringing goods, material, etc. All right? So he may get a court order to erase, to, you know, to erase or re remove the sign. I don't want to see you know, you using my, the sign on, a, on this product anymore, okay? Erase it. So you either have to, you have to erase it. And if it is unpractical and it's impossible to erase, so what the court can do is to secure the destructions of the infringing goods and uh, materials, okay? Court will give an order. Okay, if you cannot erase it, then destroy it. Simple, okay? Easy, right? So that's 58, section 58.1. Now, section 59, one, the court may grant an order that any infringing material, goods, everything, okay, in the possession of the defendant to be delivered to the plaintiff, all right? So they can give an order, okay, I want all the remaining goods in your warehouse, please deliver to the plaintiff, delivering up, we call it the deliver up order. Okay, this has nothing to do with uh, your grab food or your uh, panda food, you know, for delivery. Okay, this is a court order. They order you to delivery, okay, for the delivery of your infringed items. Yeah, so section 60 uh, also says that when infringing goods deliver to the order, okay, the court also can order that the good, such good delivered to the plaintiff to be destroyed or forfeited by the person, all right, as the court may think. All right, so that is under the delivery up order. Now, there's something I wish to remind everyone who are watching this video today. For the past many years, okay, and sorry, uh, we, we, cannot, we, cannot, uh, we cannot have any Q&A at the moment until I finished uh, this lecture, yeah? So let's come back to six, section 61. Uh. You see, for the past many years, um, uh, it's very easy for somebody like to send lawyer letters to another to, uh, to say that, oh, uh, I will threaten you, you know, um, with infringement proceedings if you still keep on using uh, the trademarks, which I think is infringing my trademark, all right? So you think, and some of, many of them are actually without basis, groundless and no evidence of uh, registration at all. Under the new provision of the law, six, section 61 of the Trademark Act says that where a person threatens another with proceedings for the infringement of a registered mark, okay, other than 
A, B, and C. I'm not going to read it. Okay. Now, I just want to bring, I, I just want to summarize for you so that it's easier for us to understand. When somebody is threatened another with the proceeding, I threaten to sue you for infringement, okay, of trademark. All right. The, uh, any aggrieved person, okay, any aggrieved person, that means basically the defendant in this case will become the plaintiff, all right, may bring proceedings of, for relief under this section. All right. So if you send me a your lawyer letter and you threaten to sue me because I, you think that I infringe your trademark, where well, I seriously believe that I don't do that. So, uh, okay. And uh, I, I can actually, I can actually bring an action against, against you. All right. Everyone still follow me, did we? Or, and, and do we have any problem here? Is the chat room okay? Oh, good, yeah? Okay, thank you. Because I am afraid, because like, I, I, I afraid that you might not be able to see my chart, everything. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for your immediate response. Okay. Let, 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 let me continue. Let me continue this. All right. So, any aggrieved person may bring an uh, proceedings for relief under these actions. I repeat, yeah, I repeat. Yeah? Now, if you send me a, a groundless threat, I will call it a baseless threat, I would say that, or, you know, you send me a, a letter, okay, threatening for the infringement proceeding against me, okay, which I think that no basis of, at all, I may actually bring an action against you. I may bring an action against you, all right? for groundless threat under section 61.1. Now, let me go uh, in detail, okay. So, what I can do? So, I can bring an action against you for sending me a groundless threat, baseless threat, or, you know, invalid, I will call it invalid threats or whatever, okay? And I can seek the following relief. I can seek the following order from the court. One. A, a declaration that the, tra the threats are unjustifiable. I, I will ask, I will tell the court to maybe ask the court for prayer to give me a relief to say that, you know, a declaration that your threats are unjustifiable and perhaps can get even an injunction against you for continuing to threaten me with all this kind of nonsense. Number C, I will seek damages in respect of any loss I suffer. Okay, by your threats. You understand? Now, the plaintiff shall entitle to relief. Okay, I will, I'm a plaintiff here. Okay, I, the plaintiff shall entitle to relief in uh, all these subsection two, A, B, C, D, unless the defendant shows that, unless you prove that, okay, that the acts in respect of which proceeding were threatened constitute, if done, would constitute an infringement of a registered trademark concern. Meaning to say that, okay, um, I will be entitled to all the damages or whatever declarations seeking from you, unless you prove that whatever I do would amount to, will constitute an act of infringement over your registered trademark. Now, if you cannot do that, you better don't threaten me to, you know, don't, bet, don't stop threatening me, all right? So if you can, cannot do that, stop threatening one another, okay? And I will seek my relief from you. Unless you can prove that, you know, whatever I'm doing, whatever I'm doing, the acts, I'm, my acts actually constitute, um, you know, uh, an infringement over your registered trademark. Anyone, okay? Still good with, with this, huh? So... The plaintiff uh, shall never tell us to be relieved. Uh. However, you see, that's the trick of the law here. Okay. Scenario three, clause three says that now you better stop threatening me for trademark infringement or else I will seek relief under subsection two, A, B, C, D against you because you are sending me threatened letters. You want to sue me for trademark infringement but you couldn't show any proof, groundless and baseless infringement. Okay, unless you 
show that whatever I'm doing would constitute an infringement over your registered trademark. Okay, everyone clear on this, right? So there's another scenario here, clause four. Now, the plaintiff, I will be the plaintiff here. The plaintiff shall nevertheless be entitled to relief if he shows that the registration of the trademark is invalid or liable to be revoked in a re relevant respect. Now see, even you have a registration, a trademark registration, it doesn't mean that you, know, you can simply threaten me. Maybe there are some technical flaw in your trademark registration, which might result in the revocations of your trademark registrations, such as perhaps you register in bad faith, or perhaps there's a distinct, uh, your mark is uh, neither uh, distinctive nor you know, uh, fulfilling the, uh, the essential requirement of a trademark registration and subject to invalidation and subject to revocations. In that respect, can still actually counter sue you and then I can still um, entitle to the relief under this clause two, you know, A and B, C, D. Okay, sorry, A, B, C, all right? So what can we do now? Can we send letter and threaten people? Well, obviously from section 60, you know, 61, it's, you know, it's not advisable to simply send a threat letter, a threaten letters unless, unless you really have the uh, proof and you really have the, uh, what they call it, um, everything is in place before you start sending. But you may send a mere notifications, okay, that your trademark is registered or an application for registration has been made. And this will not constitute a threat of proceedings, okay? So if I file in my trademark today and then, I would say, um, you, who's the other guy here? Uh, Miss Jane, yeah, you're using my trademarks, okay? And um, I know it's a bit similar. I'm not quite sure whether it's identical, but as you know that I, I'm still applying for it, or maybe I have a registered trademark for it. I can send you a notifications uh, letters to say that my trademark is registered, okay? or has been applied for reg registrations, uh, kindly refrain from using the same, all right? Or else we reserve every rights to sue you in the court of law, blah, 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 blah. Now that mere notification is okay, no problem. But please don't simply send letters. If your trademark is still unregistered, don't send them a letter threatening them to sue them in court uh, for infringing their trademark, et cetera, et cetera, okay? They will counter sue you under section 62, 61 or 62, 61, sorry, 61 for, you know, groundless threat of the uh, infringement proceedings. Okay. Now there's a trick here. Okay. Now this is the good news for lawyers under section six clause, sorry, under clause six, nothing in this section shall render an advocate and solicitor liable for an action under his this section in respect of an act done by him in his capacity of, on behalf of a client. So the, your, let, your, your lawyer sending letters on your behalf, okay, he will not get sued for this. Don't worry. So there's a privilege of being a lawyer, all right? He may send lawyers, you, you may instruct him to do it, and then he may act on your behalf, but he wouldn't get any uh, penalties, or maybe he wouldn't get any uh, relief by the plaintiff at the end of the day. So, all right? So it's, let me just clarify this provision for you so that you, you are much aware of, okay, uh, the, uh, this, uh, this provision here. All right, that's, we've, we completed the silver part, the most important part of the uh, trademark infringement. So now, just in summary, before we move on to the next chapter, we have done the uh, sections uh, 50 something, 56, no, no. Okay, 55, 54, 55, 56, and uh, 58, 59, 61, all right? We have done with the three provision, a few provisions here, whereby we actually, ex I just explained to you what are the, what, what you mean by trademark infringement and what are the conditions that a person using another's trademarks and what, you know, what are the acts does not uh, constitute any uh, trademark infringement and groundless threats Okay, these are the things that you need to know 
for a suicide IP litigation. All right. Now, before we uh, now we move on to the next part. All right. We are moving on to the next part, which uh, involve the uh, offenses under the Trademark Act. Okay. As I mentioned earlier, the Trademark Act enacted in 2019 is relative a new act. And this act's provisions includes uh, many provisions um, whereby they actually put um, heavy liability on uh, trademark offend offenders. All right. Okay. So we, are, we will be talking about the, uh, uh, some offenses as follow. Um, I hope everybody still can bear with me. Okay, I think I try to make it as simple, as straightforward for you. And I understand that some of you may have questions, but uh, in IP talks, we don't actually, uh, I don't answer Q&A first. All right, let me finish my, my lectures. Okay, section 99, that is the very, uh, that's the first provisions that I want to discuss today. Okay, and this one concerning the uh, counterfeiting of a trademark. Section 99.1, any person who counterfeits a registered trademark by making a sign identical with or similar with another trademark, registered trademark, with intent to deceive or falsifying a genuine registered trademark, whether by alteration, additions, and facement, otherwise, now without the consent, of course, from the registered trademark proprietor, will commit an offense and upon conviction, on convictions, shall be liable to a fine, one not exceeding, not exceeding one million ringgit, or imprisonment a term not exceeding five years or both. So uh, let me give you a uh, example here. Now this is a real LV bag and a fake LV bag. Okay, so you are making a fake LV bag, and you get caught, you will be fined up to one million ringgit. Simple. You are counterfeiting. You're counterfeiting uh, products, okay? You're making with intent to deceive, all right? You think counterfeiting like uh, making fake, uh, you know, paper notes, okay? So that that's with intent to deceive. The same for the for this uh, making of a uh, you know uh, genuine, you know, making a genuine trademark uh, products as well, and the trademark products, yeah, okay. So that's section ninety nine. Now, let me explain what is section 100, okay? Falsely applying a registered trademark to goods and services. Sounds very new to you. What do you mean by falsely applying a registered trademark to goods and services? So, under section 100, subsection 1, okay? A person falsely applying a registered trademark to goods and services when he applied a trademark or a sign likely to be mistaken for the trademark to the goods or services without the consent of the registered proprietor. Okay? And of course, in the gen end, in the case of uh, application to goods, the goods are not genuine goods of a registered proprietor. Okay? So you are making a fact, uh, uh, you are not, uh, of course, the goods are not genuine goods of the uh, registered proprietor we are talking about here. And of course, uh, you're applying a trademark without the consent from the registered proprietor. Basically, this is the definition one and B. Two, now a trademark shall be deemed to apply to goods and services if it used in any sign or advertisement or invoice, catalog, business letter, business paper, commercial in any mediums including website, okay? Because website is a medium of advertising, all right? Now, if you want to put in uh, some other online e-commerce platform, um, that is also uh, advertising, okay? And the goods are delivered, sold to the person, pursuant to an order, okay? And make reference to the trademark as used. Now, let me see this. Okay, let me explain all this one, provision 100 first, okay? Right? Section 100. Section 103, a trademark, a sign shall be deemed to be applied to goods if it's applied to the goods themselves, applied to the covering or labeling of the goods, all right? And uh, a, a sign shall be deemed to apply to goods and services if it's used in a manner that is likely to lead a person to believe that it refers to, describe, designate the goods and services. 
Now you see that the, I highlighted the, the word covering and label. It also includes uh, a box, a vessel, a wrapping case, a frame, etc. Et, et cetera, et cetera. Let me give you an example. Today, let's say you are, um, you are selling a watch. It might be other brand, okay? Any brand. But you are putting it into a, 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 a box, okay? With a, uh, a big Lorex uh, label, trademarks, okay? On it. Example, I just give you an example, okay, in good faith. Now, uh, or maybe you are using uh, other brands like uh, Patrick Phillips or whatever brands you, you think you can think of it. So, you see, you might think that, oh, I am putting, I'm selling a product, but I'm using the cover, the box cover of uh, other brands so that it looks very appealing. Uh, people might thought that, oh, uh, you know, uh, I'm selling this expensive watch brand. So am I infringe? Am I falsely applying it? Yes, you are falsely applying somebody's uh, registered trademark onto a box. Okay. Now, let me go back to the subsection two. Any sign or advertisement. All right. Now, in any medium. Okay. So if you are selling through your website, if you are selling through maybe Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, or whatever you name it or you stay, sell to any kind of medium, online platform, okay? You expose for sale. Now that is also falsely applying the trademark, okay? That's also falsely applying other trademark without their consent. It is an offense. So how should we punish this offender? Now under section 104, okay? Any person who falsely apply a trademark to goods commits an offense, on conviction shall be liable. If you are a body corporate, like a company, etc., etc., you will be fined, not exceeding 15,000 for each goods. Each goods, okay? 15,000 each goods, all right? If you are caught, and that's the first offender, you know, if you are caught subsequently, you'll be fined 30,000 for each goods. So if you have, let's say, um, uh, 10 items, 10 uh, falsely applied items, you put it on shelf for, uh, for display, for sale, okay? And then uh, once they caught you, you know, you will be fined 15,000 each, up to 15,000 each. So if the, if, the, if the court say that, all right, I'm going to charge you for one, I'm, I'm going to fine you for 1,000 each, so times 10, it will be 10,000. That's for body corporates, all right? For individuals, um, the fine is not exceeding 10,000. Now, if I caught you, you know, just like a pasta malam, you're selling one person there or whatever, okay, and you're the only boss, no companies, nothing, so you'll be fined 10,000 for each goods, bearing the falsely applied trademarks. That is only for goods, yeah? And what about services? What about services, okay? If you apply a falsely, uh, if you falsely apply a registered trademark, you know, to your services, then if you're a company, you will be fined not exceeding 100,000. Or you, if you're not a company, you'll be fined not exceeding 70,000. Now, let me give you an example of these uh, uh, services, uh, this scenario. Um, let's imagine, okay? Come on, let's imagine, okay? I'm, um, I'm a big, I'm the boss of a, uh, of a big money game company, all right? And uh, I'm holding a big, seminar, a big webinar so that I can actually attract people to come and listen and join my seminar. And then I would, in the seminar, I will persuade them to give me all the money they have in their pockets, all right, to invest in my beautiful companies where they can make millions and millions of dollars in this scheme, Chapat Kaya, we call it, all right. So while doing that, I'm, when I try to convince you guys to invest in me, of course, sometime I will apply the trademark of, uh, of the major banks in Malaysia, okay? The, the Lion Banks, the Octopus Bank, and what else? Or oh, the Housing Bank, okay? Whatever banks, all right? And meanwhile, I also apply, maybe uh, falsely applying using uh, the registered trademark of the big law firms or big accounting firms, all right? So, uh, onto my, you know, my brochures, 
my catalogs, my webinars, my seminar slides, etc. etc. So, because I want to attract people to come in and actually, you know, um, I want to tell them that look, I am uh, liaising, I am uh, having businesses, I'm uh, backing up by all these major banks in Malaysia, and also I will. I'm audited by all these major, you know, top, top, top uh, auditing audit audit firms in Malaysia. So it it makes your accounting looks great, and people are convinced that oh, you are a genuine business owner, and they are mistakenly misled misled into believing that you might be an uh, angel for them. You know, so you might help to increase their revenue so that they can earn one million ringgit within a year. Now. Of course, all these trademark owners can come and sue, come after this, uh, this, 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 this guy, okay, uh, for falsely applying other people, you know, trademark onto their services, okay, as well as the goods. So this is just one scenario, one uh, fictitious scenario that I created, just to tell you like uh, how this thing works, all right. So upon conviction, you'll be fine as well. This is under the offenses, okay. You'll be fine, one hundred thousand, not exceeding, or seventy thousand for individuals. Okay, now I already um, explained. I believe I explained what are the uh, you know uh, the uh, what is the falsely applied trademark under provision section one hundred of the Trademark Act. So let's look at section one zero one, making and possessing of article for com committing offence. All right. Making and possessing. So what's making? Making basically you are making it. All right. You are manufacturer. You are OEM. You are making this infringe. Not infringe. I would say these items. Okay. These items, and then or has in his possessions custody control. Okay. Of the items. So if you do that, if you make any of this, uh, you know, uh, you're making a copies of the registered mark likely to be mistaken for the trademark, then you're co committing an offence, okay? Uh, under Section 99 as well, all this, you will be also liable to a fine not exceeding 1 million ringgit or imprisonment not exceeding 5 years or both. That is for making and in possessions of articles of committing offence. So, um, for, what about for importing and selling? Okay, if I open a, if I am an importer or maybe I'm a retailer or maybe I'm a hypermarket, okay, can I sell? What happens if I sell any falsely applied trademarks? Section 102 says that any person who imports in Malaysia for the purpose of trade or manufactures, sells, offer for sales, exposed for sales, has in his possessions custody control of the trade items. Okay, all right. Okay, um, any goods to which the registered trademark is falsely applied under Section 100, unless he's proved that, all right, you have to prove that you have taken all reasonable steps, precaution against committing such an offense, or else, okay, or else, uh, wait, you will be, you will be liable for these offenses here, okay? Before I go to the offenses, let me just give you a rough idea. When I say possession, what do you mean by in his possessions? Okay. What do you mean by that? Okay. So 102, sorry, uh, 102, subsection 2 of the Trademark Act says that a person having in his possessions three or more item of the goods which a registered mark is falsely applied apply, is deemed to have in possession of the goods for the purpose of trade and manufacturers. So if you possess one, two, never mind, but three items, three, okay, and above, then you are deemed to have in possessions of the goods for the purpose of trade or manufacturers. So you, in other words, people say you kenala if you get three items and above, all right? Now, let's come back to the offenses, the penalty sites. Now, if you're caught importing and selling or selling goods with falsely applied trademark, registered trademark, so what are the offenses here? What are the penalty here? If you are a body corporate, you'll be fined, okay? Not exceeding 15,000 for each uh, goods, right? For each goods. 
And of course, if you are individuals, you'll be fine not exceeding 10,000 for each goods. All right. Now, that's only for first offender. If you are the subsequent or second offender, the fine will increase double to 30,000 for body corporate and 20,000 for individuals for each item of goods. Okay. So if you have in your possession 10 infringed, as I'll say, 10 falsely applied trademark items, okay, you kindly multiply the, you know, the, uh, the, the penalty, okay, for each one. So, okay, I believe I have uh, covered the part, the most important part, the new provision under this uh, trademark act. It has never been before in the past old act that these words came out in the new, in the, in the, in the old act. So in the new act, the legislation also uh, includes the uh, provisions and the punishment for counterfeiting and for falsely applying a, tra a registered trademark onto a sale, onto a goods and services uh, for importing or selling and for making, all right, as well as for making. So um, before I move on to the other side, I just want to tell, advise some of the uh, operator for the uh, online e-commerce operator, all right. You will be equally charged and liable, you know, because you're exposing for sale. You're exposing for sales, all right, uh, through your e-commerce web mediums, okay, through your online platforms. If you do not comply with the request from the registered trademark owner to remove any uh, items from the uh, what they call it from the uh, online shopping, okay, online online what they call it online e-commerce. Uh, you know, uh, what they call it, uh, shops, uh, okay, uh, containing any falsely applied trademark items. Understand? So, even for hypermarket, like, uh, you know, big hypermarkets, the big names that you call it, okay, um, you have to be very careful whether you are big hypermarket or small retailers. Uh, the mo whenever you try to, you know, whenever you take, you buy goods from any suppliers and you want to resell it, and you want to expose it for sale, uh, please be very careful and always request the uh, manufacturers, oh, sorry, the manufacturers always request the, uh, the, 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 uh, the resellers, okay, your, your, your suppliers, the uh, trademark registrations for your own protections, okay? Because you have to take all reasonable steps to protect the and, uh, precautions, okay, against committing the offenses, all right? Or else, if you don't do that, Okay, uh, once you caught, okay, once you caught selling any goods with falsely applied trademark, all right, with falsely applied trademark, you will be equally liable. Okay, you will be equally liable. You will be facing all these penalties here. All right, so bear in mind, ladies and gentlemen, okay, and those who are watching today, tonight, uh, lectures, uh, you must bear in mind, okay. All this. All right. Corporate responsibility. Now, you see, during the past, uh, if I operate a, a store and I'm selling counterfeit products, okay, somewhere in, you know, in uh, maybe Pataling Street or maybe in somewhere, you know, in, in Malaysia, um, usually I don't actually put my name on it. I don't actually uh, operate under my real name, or maybe I just operate under a fictitious name, or maybe I don't even have a business name at all, okay? I will just uh, operate under the, uh, we call it the agency or whatever, all right? So let me tell you in two scenarios under the statute law, okay? The responsibility of um, the employers, the agents, the principals, okay? Section 137 of the Trademark Act actually define the uh, principal liabilities for the acts of the servant and the agent. Now, let me define what is the agents and the principal here. If I ask you to maybe to sell products for me and the product is uh, falsely applying the, re the registered trademark of uh, another person, okay? Of course, without their consent. And a report was lodged by the person and you got in trouble, okay? You were caught for selling goods with falsely applied trademark. 
So can I get my hands off here and say that, hey, whatever you do is nothing to do with me, all right? I'm your principal. They will come after you. You are bad luck. Sorry. The answer is no. Section 137 actually says that, you know, the principal, actually, they call it the principal. You see, this is how I read the provisions. Where the servants or agents of a person commits an offense, that means that your agent commits an offense or, or does anything to commit offense, okay? Um, omitted to be done by the person would constitute an offense, okay, under this act. That person shall be deemed guilty of an offense unless he proved that the omission, the, the act complaint was not within the ordinary scope of the employment of the servant or the agency of the agent. You see, whatever your agents do under, you know, um, um, I mean, I'm your principal and you're my agent. You are selling those items for me. Whatever you do, I mean, whatever items that I entrusted you to sell, and let's say it's, uh, you're selling some of the goods which, uh, uh, with, with a, a falsely applied trademark and you got, in, you, you got into trouble. So I will be equally liable, okay? I will be equally liable. I will be deemed guilty also, all right? So uh, unless I can prove that I didn't, I didn't tell you to sell this product and you are acted not within the ordinary scope of the employment or, or the agency of the agents, or you have done something and act without my consent, then I'm okay, I'm off. Otherwise, otherwise um, the principal will be equally liable as well. So 138 of the Trademark Act says that um, these are offenses committed by body corporate. Now, I, I do mention in the provision section uh, 99 and 100, and I also tells you that, um, uh, so what are the pen penalties for body corporates and individuals, right? Body corporates means those with companies, with uh, corporations, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So who will be liable for body corporate? Can the company just pay off the big check and then they say, okay, no one is liable? Well, um, if a body corporate commits under section 1381, it says that if a body corporate commits an offense under this act, any person who at the time of the commission of the offense, he was a director, a CEO, COO, manager, secretary, or similar officer of the body corporate, or uh, purporting to act in a such capacity or maybe responsible, the person responsible for the daily management of the, uh, any affairs of the body corporate, okay, may be charged severely and or jointly in the same proceeding with the body corporate. So if the government sued the body corporate, let's say ABC St. Rambert Hutt, and at the same time, uh, Mr. Lawrence Yip is the director of the ABC St. Rambert Hutt, he may be charged uh, jointly as well, or severely, severely means separately, okay? Or jointly as well with the company, ABC and Rebohat. Okay? So there's no, no saying that, oh, they only sue the company, it wouldn't get involved with the directors. So if there is no directors, uh, not to say no directors, I mean, you couldn't find the directors, maybe it's a, some people say it's a fictitious body, like, uh, may put it this way, it's a Alibaba company, okay? So you put a, uh, a foreigners to become a directors. And then, uh, uh, yes, he will be charged. And maybe even the managers or any person who are actually responsible for the, for the uh, operations or for the management of the company or the affairs of the company may be charged, okay? May be charged, okay? May be charged means can be charged. All right, in other words, in the legal language. All right, so uh, please bear in mind. Yeah? So, worst come to worst, they'll look for the company secretary because the secretary name, actually, the secretary is a very important person for the company. All right, so that's 137 and 138. I just want to let you know the uh, uh, body corporate liability responsibility in this manner. Okay, now if a body corporate is found guilty, okay of an offense unless, um, unless having regard to the nature of the capacity, he proved that uh, if, I mean, if the officers, as I mentioned here, okay, 
those officers that I mentioned here, the directors. If I, um, if a body corporate is found guilty, unless he can prove that the offense is committed without his knowledge, oh, I didn't know about it. I have no consent. I didn't consent to it. And he has taken all reasonable steps. Okay, all reasonable steps to prevent and exercise the due diligence, okay, to prevent the commission of the offense. Well, he must prove that. The burden of proof is on the, uh, the, uh, the directors or the managers to prove that he has taken all reasonable steps to do that. So, um, he, and of course, you must convince the, the judge, okay, to let you go. Okay, if you, the company is found guilty and you say you're not guilty. Okay, if any person would be liable under this act or punishment for his act, negligence, omission, he shall be liable for the same punishment penalty for such acts, okay, of any employee agents of his or, uh, you know, of the agents if the act was committed by the person employee in the course of employment. Meaning to say that if you employ somebody, if your company employed somebody to sell um, fake, counterfeited, okay, LV bags or bags or whatever things, okay, your employee kena, you also kena, okay, in other words, put it this way, your employee get it, you also get it, all right, okay, and uh, unless you prove that, uh, uh, okay, by the agent, even your agent, okay, acting on behalf of the person or by the employee of that agent, so he will be liable for the same punishment. Uh, that is section, section 138, all right? The subsection two of the Trademark Act. All right, okay, let's come to the last chapter for tonight. Let's look into the enforcement, okay? Enforcement uh, sectors. First, I would like to start with uh, section 111, subsection one. Very easy, okay? This is not the number plate of every domestic trade enforcer in Malaysia, but this is a section number that you want to re remember for the rest of your life. Section 111, subsection one, okay? It gives the power to the assistant controller. Now, all these people in blue color, next time, they call themselves the assistant controller. You have the controller, uh, deputy controller, assistant controller, okay? This is definitely not a remote control, okay, vehicles. These are humans, these are, you know, enforcement people, okay, doing the enforcement job, okay? Understand? So, section 1111, okay, says that, at the, I call it AC, okay? The assistant controller has reasonable ground to suspect if they have reasonable, reasonable ground to suspect any offenses committed under this act, he may conduct investigations, all right? He may conduct in investigation. He may exercise any power in relation to the police investigation in seizable case given by the criminal penal code. So all these people rested in uh, blue color, the enforcement people, um, they have the power to investigate. They are like the police officer, but they are not... They are not police officer, okay? They are just uh, enforcement. They call it the controller, assistant controller. All right. So remember these three letter, uh, three numbers, yeah. One 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 one. Okay. So one one three two. One one three two, under the section one 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 three subsection two, and sorry, ah yes, one one two. Sorry, okay. One one two. Any person may lodge a complaint, okay. Uh, to the assistant controller. And of course, once the person lodges a complaint, the assistant controller will then investigate on the person who has committed or is committing any, any offense under this act. All right? So basically, if you are a registered trademark owner and you, you know that somebody is infringing your trademark, the best thing you do is get your trademark registration certificates Go, at, go, to the, uh, go to the controller, assistant controller. Of course, you must show them some evidence, the locations, the locality of the, uh, uh, the, the, the premise, okay, where the offenses uh, uh, are committed, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So 
you must give some evidence. Of course, they will, under Section 112, they will conduct investigation on your behalf. All right? This is if someone is actually counterfeiting or falsely applying your registered trademark, which is identical. However, in many situations, um, sometimes the trademark they apply is not identical. Perhaps it's similar. So what you should do is under section 1123, you can actually first apply to the trademark registrar, to the registrar of trademark, we call it a, to obtain a registrar verifications. So this thing called ver registrar verification is basically, uh, you need to sign a form or if you do not know how to do that, come see me, okay? Um, of course, I will charge my fees on that. And then, but you will get the registrar verifications to compare whether your trademark, the infringed trademark and your trademark are actually similar or identical in such a way. So if yes, if the answer is yes, then you may submit the uh, registrar verification to the, again, to the assistant controller for, to conduct an investigations, okay? To conduct further investigation. And the registrar verification shall become a prima facie evidence in the court of law, okay? It's admissible as a legal, as, as a law, good evidence, okay? For under this section 1124. So what can the assistant controller do? Under 1132, the assistant controller, of course, uh, he can give notice directing any person, okay, within a period to come before him for, you know, for investigations and also to submit any documents or information, whether it's in physical form or in electronic forms, okay? Under section 114, the assistant controller may retain any documents for any durations that he think fits, okay, for due to investigations. And of course, a certified true copy of the document shall be admissible as evidence under these uh, provisions. Now, during the investigations, okay, if we are providing any false and misleading information or evidence to the assistant controller, you, meet, you, you will be charged under section 117 whereby the penalty is very cheap, all right? Not exceeding 100,000 ringgit, all right? So please do not provide any misleading information to the uh, uh, assistant controller, all right? Under section 119, an assistant controller, he may arrest any person without warrant where he has reason to believe that he is committing or attempt to commit the offense under section 99 to 102. So we know that 90, section 99 is for counterfeiting. Uh, section 100 is for falsely applied trademarks. All right. So, uh, however, after arresting the person, he must produce the person before uh, to the nearest police station. He cannot bring, bring him home to the office or to his house. He must bring the person to the nearest police station. Okay. For detention and uh, for the, uh, uh, what do you call it? Section 120, the, any assistant controller may at any hours, it's so it's 24 hours, yeah, okay, exercise the following powers. He may inspect goods, okay, documents, materials, and enter any premise other than the premises used for dwellings, meaning that other than your house, he can go to your shop, factory, anywhere, offices, and he can seize any goods, any materials, any things that, you know, uh, for testing purpose, for ascertaining purpose. And um, if you have a container or you have a vending machine, he may ask the person in charge to open it. Now, if you do not comply or the person cannot be found, he may open it himself. Okay, he may break open it himself. Okay, this is section 1201. 1203, okay. Um, if some, he may, he may, um, because sometimes there are so many items and it's not practical to remove where they are. 
So he may order to seal off the premises, to seal off the container, okay, and it shall be an offense if anybody uh, attempt or try to break open or maybe tempered or you know destroy that uh, items. He may seal any premises as well. Now, section 121, magistrate may uh, issue search warrant. Okay? The magistrate can issue a search warrant to any AC to enter any premise at any time with or without assistance. So if you got a warrant, he can call a big uh, few police officer to accompany him. Yeah, maybe. All right. So the magistrate order also authorized them to seize and search the goods material. He may search your whole office for it. Okay. And then uh, he may search any person for it. Okay. Now, this is when you enter with warrant. Okay. And also, the magistrate may uh, issue a search warrant. And of course, in the search warrant, the uh, AC may seal off the premises or container. And any attempt to remove, you will get fined no more than 100,000 ringgit Malaysia. That's a search warrant given by the magistrate. Now, sometimes it is very unlikely, uh, maybe you know, uh, based on the information received that, uh, uh, that, that, that the AC has any reason to believe that uh, because of the delay in obtaining the search warrant under section 121 from the magistrate, the investigation will be obviously affected. You see, the court don't open at night. Okay? Sometimes, crimes committed at night. Now, they need to act as soon as possible. Okay? So, they may conduct a search without warrant under uh, section 122 of the Trademark Act. Now, the scope of the power given under 122 is exactly the same like section 121. Okay? As though as he's authorized to do so by section 121. Okay. So, if anyone came to your door, or this AC came to your door, and you refuse to open, you know, you obstruct, and then you maybe you delay, okay, the investigations, or maybe you assault any officers of the ACs. Now you'll be charged, and there's a penalty for it, not exceeding 100,000. All right. If you do not open, they give you a warning, you don't open your door and let, allow people to come in to investigate, you will be charged for 131, not exceeding 100,000 ringgit. Okay, so, well, let's come to the end of this, uh, today's lectures. I think the time now is 9.20, all right? I think uh, about one hour, and I hope you all like it. Just hang on, let me just stop this. All right, um, so today's, in today's uh, lectures, we have discussed basically on the civil rights, okay, the civil civil IP litigation suits, which, you know, whereby you are allowed to, whereby the plaintiff can bring an action of a trademark infringement against the defendant and the relief. And also, we also discuss what other acts does not constitute the uh, uh, infringement. Of course, on the general offenses side, which is, a, I would say, is more like a criminal offenses. Okay, you have these uh, counterfeiting, okay, anti-counterfeiting provisions. Section 99, Section 100, 101, and 102. Making and importing. All right? So you have also discussed, we have also discussed on the, um, the power of the enforcement officers under Section uh, 1111, uh, 1112, okay? Et cetera, et cetera. And uh, I think for this one hour, I hope, uh, I hope uh, everyone will be benefited from my uh, sharings for my, my short discussions and my short lectures. I hope you will stay tuned for our next IP Talk 5. Um, I'm so sorry because there cannot be Q&A today. And if you have any uh, queries, you are always welcome to uh, email to us or maybe uh, call us up or maybe uh, send me a message through our trademark to your Facebook. And then... Uh, our people, uh, we will be able to answer you uh, in a short while, okay? 
I, I won't be answering here today because if I answer all the questions, I think it would take time. So again, I want to uh, thanks all the, uh, what I call it, all, all the attendees, okay, uh, today for tonight's lectures. And uh, you're wonderful. You can stay with me for one hour and I thank you for your attention. I hope my short briefing will tell you more about the in, some of the in-depth about the new amendment to the uh, Trademark Act. And once again, thank you everybody and have a good evening. All right, I will sign off from here. Thank you so much.